Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Garden and Nursery Report. I'm David Whitwam, your host. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. So I hope everybody had a very Merry Christmas and got everything that they wanted. Um, so before we get in, before we get into the nursery report uh, and garden report, I wanted to kind of show you guys some of the stuff that that my family got me for Christmas, um, just because it's funny. But um, let's see, we'll start with, um, this isn't all I got, by the way, I got a lot of great gifts. Um, I guess it's all, if I'm gonna do this, it's only fair for me to get my big, my, my favorite gift. I wouldn't call it my big gift, but one of my favorites, but um, I'm gonna go grab that. I'll be right back, hang on. Okay, I'm back. So, um, I don't know how many of you guys like give each other practical gifts in your stockings, but that's what most of these are. So we obviously did lots of other ones, but um, which one should I show you? I'll show you. This one. So this little guy right here. Anybody's ever driven around in my truck with me will know. Um, this is a handy dandy little vacuum cleaner that goes under my seat for inside my truck. And um, I will probably fill this thing up with dirt like the first time I use it. But at least I'll, maybe I'll be able to like reach over and vacuum off the passenger seat before somebody has to get in my truck because usually I just dust it off with my hand and Tell them to sit down. Maybe I'll grab an old towel from the back seat and put it down. But if you ride my truck with me, chances are you're going to have a dirty butt by the time we get where we're going because I put trays of plants in my passenger seat. That's usually what I'm riding around with um, is uh, plants, not people. If you just tuned in, I'm showing off some of my uh, Christmas presents here. And then this one, I don't know what these say about why. I got underwear. I got new underwear. So these right here should last me. We got like five pairs here. Probably six months. I'm pretty hard on pants and underwear and everything. Anybody else who works outside or gardens probably knows what I'm talking about. But um, that's my underwear. <laughs> I also got a toothbrush. Ooh, a Sonicare toothbrush. This was not in my stocking. This one was wrapped up. A very nice toothbrush. And then I also got. Y'all totally wish you had one of these. That is a poop timer. <laughs> so apparently, uh, apparently I spend too much time in the bathroom <laughs> my tmi <laughs> see that you turn it upside down and the guy's pooping so there we go but my real uh gift that i really enjoyed that i'm excited about is hey i got a dehydrator i'm so excited about this i got a dehydrator so i will actually be able to um do something with all these fruits and vegetables when I have lots of excess. Uh, usually I just uh, try and freeze it. Um, dehydrating was kind of my next venture to go down. Um, and then after that, we'll be getting into like canning and possibly fermenting and stuff, but probably won't be till like next year. This would have been a good year to learn that sitting at home and all. All righty. Uh, so enough of that. I hope everybody had a good uh, Christmas. Mine was, um, mine was great. Uh, chill, laid very laid back. I just kind of hung out at the house, 
my wife's parents and my parents both came to us this year instead of us having to run around, but that was just to keep them more safe. Um, so, so yeah, that's probably the last year we get to do that. Usually we're the ones running around going everywhere as it should be. We're definitely, um, more in our peak years than our parents are. Um, so I would much rather be exhausted at the end of the day on Christmas than to have them exhausted, uh, running around. So, but Oh, COVID. So, um, nursery and garden report. Um, it's really, I mean, this time of year, um, same thing. If you've been watching these videos, or um, we are basically doing the same thing from around maybe the end of November. As far as planting, like what we're planting until right about now. So within the next couple of weeks, we'll be switching it up. We're going to keep doing what we've been doing, but we're adding back into the mix instead of just planting our brassicas, leafy vegetables, lettuces, spinach, cool weather crops, collard greens, broccoli, um, cabbage, Chinese cabbage, uh, you choice some broccoli. Uh, I mean, I mean, bok choy, uh, rapini, you name it. If I, I always say this, if I leave anything off, um, <laughs> Mike, Michael Thorne got a dehydrator too. Cool. <laughs> if I leave anything off, feel free to type it out of stuff that we should be planting in succession right now. I know I'm leaving off all of the root crops because this is a nursery report and we are not planting root crops in our nursery for sale. Uh, we sell those uh, by seed only for direct seeding. If you're following along with what we're planting in our nursery uh, to kind of get an indicator of what you should be planting in your garden, I always like to mention add root crops to that list um, because this is this is the peak season. Usually we'll plant everything that we're planting in our gardens right now that we've been planting since November, beginning of December. We will continue to plant until February or March. Um, I'll probably do my last late season planting uh, in early March for winter crops. That's in my nursery and direct seeded in my gardens that I help take care of. Now, new to the mix, what we're adding back in is it is time to get some of your long season spring vegetables going. Um, that would be tomatoes peppers and eggplants um that's january mid-january ish february you should start thinking about definitely getting the seeds started or considering buying starts for your spring garden um there is uh i, I kind of use a formula this is for central florida if you're watching this video i'm in tampa um, if you're watching this video in another part of the state or another part of the country, so just take that, uh, take that into mind while I'm talking, but you can kind of apply some of these same principles to, uh, to what you're doing. But essentially for my spring stuff, my, uh, fruits and vegetables that I would not consider a winter crop because they can't take a frost and ones that I would not consider a summer crop because, in the the peak weather uh of what i would consider central florida summer to be these plants are not happy so that's how i get my what my um my category my basket of spring slash fall crops anything that can't take a frost and isn't happy over the summer so I would just kind of consider those vegetables and fruits done by Father's Day. That's just, that's a real general, good, good general help you figure out like when to plant. So if you're just going to assume that your tomatoes are going to be dead by Father's Day, you need to, and you look at a pack of tomatoes if it's a 60-day tomato or a 90-day tomato, you look at Father's Day, count backwards from there, and know that that date, so if it's a 90-day tomato, it's going to start producing in 90 days. So three months back from 
Father's Day is when you would need to plant it if you want them to start producing on the day they die, right? So from that date, that now you got a starting date of, of if I want to plant my seeds right now, they're going to start producing on Father's Day, 90 days from now. And then you start counting backward from there on how many weeks of production do you expect to get out of this plant, okay? And you'll see that on some of these longer season spring crops, even for a short harvest season, why we have to start planting them in January to mid-January. It's just simple math. It, and this is, this is why so many people run into an issue of having to worry about pest control um, and, and heat damage, all the, all the crap that comes with trying to grow spring vegetables over our summer is because they planted too late. So if with that same mapping of a calendar, that will help you figure out um, when to plant your zucchini, which is could be a 45, 50, 55 day crop, right? Um, how many weeks do you expect to get a production out of that plant? Um, and you add that to it, count back from there, that's when you I plant. I didn't understand that. Gosh, my phone listens to me. It's the creepiest thing. I'm not even talking to my phone and it responds. Um, so this is why in our nursery right now, we're starting to plant uh, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Now, you need to, you need to keep them uh, protected from the cold weather. Out in our nursery, we have heating pads. I have these little uh, plastic domes that I can put over one tray. Um, I like to use plug trays. So if we do get some really crazy intense uh, cold weather, I can take 200 plants in my hand and bring them inside for the night. So we're not talking about planting this stuff out in the garden. We're talking about planting it with some sort. Of, I, I personally um, think that you're working backwards if you plant your stuff inside to protect it from the weather. When <clears throat> nine out of ten days, the weather is fine for that stuff to be growing outside. Maybe, you know, one out of ten, one out of 20 days, one out of 30 days over the winter time, those plants really need to be product, pr protected. So here you've put in indoor lighting, got this whole indoor grow operation for literally three, four, five days of the entire, you know, winter season that that plant has to be growing and protected before you can plant it out in your garden. I just, I don't see how that makes sense. So we just plant everything outside. We do uh, have a clear plastic cover over it to protect it from some of the rain. Um, and again, if it's, if the weather's going to get too too cold we'll just bring them all in and and put them on the floor in the office or something um so that's what we're kind of adding to the mix the tomatoes peppers and eggplants and another few weeks after that will be squash cucumbers zucchini um not too far behind the um tomatoes peppers and eggplants are also going to be any of your longer season um like squash and melons and stuff. So again, you're just for pretty much everything that you call a, a spring slash fall plant, you want to just consider Father's Day. Just any day that stuff is growing and producing after Father's Day, consider that, you know, lucky days. Don't count on them. And and so kind of just bank on it. Listen, if you were up north, then Father's Day would be your average first frost date right so even if people can tell all these stories about how they grew x y or z past the average first frost date right any fool who you would be a fool to 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 like push all your weight on your fall growing season if you lived up north on the years that it was possible to grow past the average first frost date, right? Um, so for our spring stuff in central Florida, 
if you just kind of consider Father's Day our first frost date, our day of first snowfall average, and and bank your entire spring growing season on that, you're going to do so much better. Um, that's pretty much the nursery and garden report, and I've already started getting, as I usually do, I've already just kind of smeared, mooshed right into what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and that is basically um, some some of the fundamental things that I think that you should do to get the most out of your gardening. Um, I'm going to be a little bit all over the place with this, uh, but there's some main concepts that I want you to pull away with this. First and foremost is I think that you need to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. I see a lot of people out there who, when they're first getting started, they talk about learn wanting to learn how to grow their own food to be more self-sufficient. And what that means is that you need to have some sort of production out of your yard. And then six months or a year and a half into it, you talk to them again and they're like, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just having fun. You know, this is my outside time. So they, they basically went from trying to be a, a, you know, a homestead farmer to a hobbyist. And I'm not saying either or is, you know, one's better than the other. But most of the people that I don't think can, can either get over that hump or take a good long look in the mirror and be honest with themselves, they don't stick with it. Um, perfect example. I could lie to myself all day long that my fishing hobby provides meat for my family. But the truth of the matter is, is we're spending $300 a pound on the fish that I bring home because it's a hobby, right? It's something I enjoy doing outside. I do not fool myself that I'm feeding my family with fishing. It's a nice side effect but I could just as easily go out there and catch fish and throw them back because I'm outside to enjoy myself. That's, that is a hobby for me. And so, you know, I think if there is a part of you that wants this to be more than a hobby, the, the gardening part, not fishing, then there's some things I think you need to get under your belt to, to kind of at least be able to scratch that itch a little bit. And first and foremost is <laughs> distinguishing between experimenting and playing. And again, I'm not knocking playing at all. I like to play outside too. But if there isn't some research behind what you're doing, some level of controls, okay, you're just playing. You're not experimenting. And what I mean by that is you won't really know how to gauge your results. And, and experimentation is for the purpose of making a change or making a new decision going forward into the future. So if you're trying five different things at the same so let's say you're trying five different kinds of seeds and you're trying to grow this stuff outside of the season – and you're trying a new soil at the same time, you're going to have absolutely no idea why something was successful or why something failed. So one of the first things you want to do is you want to eliminate your variables, okay? And that's how you get into more of what I would call experimentation rather than just playing. There's nothing wrong with playing. I'm all about it. I'm talking about being able to keep going with this because – you're, you're not in some state of actual disappointment and trying to convince yourself that you're happy with the way things are happening. And this is why I see a lot of people fail at gardening is because, is because they're out there, they think they're experimenting and they're really playing. They really want to be growing food for themselves and their family, but they're kind of convincing themselves that uh, they're just doing it as a hobby. And that's just really not what that's not why they got into it. It's not really what they're into. So I guess what I'm trying to say, it's like if you want to have a good return on investment, 
on your gardening, if you want to feel like what you're putting in it is worth what you're getting out as far as your harvest. We can talk about health benefits. We can talk about mental benefits. Completely separate conversation. I'm talking about the physical food that you're harvesting out of the garden and feeding to your, yourself and your family. Okay? So you, you could be focused on doing that and get a little bit of fun out of it and get a little bit of uh, exercise out of it and get a little bit of mental stability out of it. Or you could be focusing on your gardening for entertainment and a hobby and the mental, you know, playing all that good stuff and get a little bit of food out of it. But you can't really have both. Okay. And when you're trying to do both and you're not really balanced, figuring out which one it is that you are, some stuff starts kind of colliding. Um, and, and you might be in a state of cognitive dissonance on what it is exactly that you're doing out there. I'm not even going to throw in the mix. Well, I am going to throw it in, but I'm just going to mention it because if anybody's going through this right now, I'm not going to need to say anything else. But I'm not going to even I'm not going to even really get into, um, you know, maybe a spouse or a family member who isn't so supportive of what you're doing, because maybe you're justifying to them how much money and time you're spending on this, because one day it's going to start producing. Um, so if you're not legitimately experimenting to get it to that point. And you're just trying a bunch of stuff. You're not doing your research. You're not talking to experts. You're not trying one thing at a time. So you're eliminating variables. You're just going to be in this state of perpetual, like sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And again, there's nothing wrong with that type of gardening at all. Okay. So I'm speaking more to people who might want to make that leap into uh, more uh, production. Um, and again, if, if you're really out there and you're working in the yard and you're staying out people's way and you're, um, it, you, you, you know, it's good for your mental health. You like getting your hands in the soil. You like playing, you like seeing some stuff live. You like seeing stuff die. That's fine. And if occasionally that, you know, produces really well and occasionally it doesn't, Again, that's totally different than, you know, if I'm trying to justify to my wife or my family why I'm spending money on a $300 fishing pole, I'm, I'm not going to present the argument that I, it's going to really bring the meat home, honey. You know, I'm going to stock our freezer. It's going to pay for itself. No, this is what I need so that when I go out there, I, I, um, I've got better equipment so I can enjoy myself more. And this is also what I want to spend money on because, you know, this is this is the this is the rod and reel to buy this year. I I don't I don't BS myself about it. Um, and and so we all end up in a, in a much better place because we kind of all know why, you know, I'm out there fishing. So for example, I'm using that as an example because if you're gardening and you're in the middle of this, you might not be. This might not be computing, so that's why I'm trying to use another analogy to try and make sense out of it, you know, uh, for you. So one of the first and easiest variables, I, people say this is the hardest one for them to get. It's the easiest one to get. One of the first and easiest variables. I People get it. They're just stubborn, okay? But one of the first and easiest variables to get is planting the right stuff during the right time of year. That goes back to what I was saying about just assuming that all your stuff's going to die on Father's Day. Just assume that from all your stuff. And all your stuff from winter is probably going to have been dead for four weeks before that, right? So one of the first things you can do to get a better return on investment, to not be playing in the garden, is stop trying to push the seasons, okay? If you're going to push the seasons at all, push them on the front end, not on the back end. What does that mean? That means starting your tomato seeds in January for the spring. 
push the season on the front end. Don't push it on the back end. Don't start your stuff in February and try to keep it past Father's Day. Okay? Now, I'm not saying it couldn't last longer than that, but it's dependent on a lot of factors. Okay? So stop trying to put, figure out what your zone is. Talk to other gardeners in your zone. The other thing, too, is I believe it or not, your first year or your first time growing in a certain area or trying a certain soil, um, you know, plant plant a decent amount of variety, okay? And I know before I said try and eliminate, try and eliminate variables, okay? But what I'm saying is if you if you have a new spot in your yard and you, I think I said that wrong, plant multiple varieties of the same thing, okay? If you're going to try cucumbers in a new spot in your yard, try four different kinds of cucumbers in the new spot in your yard. If you're going to try cucumbers with a new type of soil, try four different types of cucumbers with a new type of soil. What I found is that that actually will get you to uh, an answer a lot quicker than, say, if you just planted one type of cucumber in an area of your yard during a certain time of year and it doesn't do well and it doesn't make it, then you might come away with the wrong conclusion that cucumbers don't work. And it might just be the type of cucumber. So what I'm getting at is when, when I'm talking about putting the right plant in during the right time of year and sticking with seasons, I'm also talking about variety. So talk to other gardeners, network, and try and figure out which varieties of certain fruits and vegetables do the best for your area. What that means is that means not going to the seed catalog and buying tomatoes just because you like the way they look, okay? This is where the research comes in. The other thing too, you can contact your county extension office and you can ask them about what types, like if you're like, okay, I wanna grow tomatoes. You can call your county extension office and ask them what types of diseases attack this vegetable the most for my area, okay? So you might find out that it's a, a late blight and nematodes, right? Based on that information, try and find varieties of that fruit or vegetable that are resistant to the diseases that your area is the most problematic with, okay? So if you're planting the right variety of the right vegetable during the right season and you're trying to find varieties of that variety that have been bred for disease resistance i mean you are right now 20 steps ahead of the game than you would have been if you just started you know shooting into the air um the next thing to do really is Make sure, if you have the options, that you put your garden in the most sunny location possible, okay? Vegetables need sunlight. Fruits need sunlight. There's no such thing as the evil Florida sun burning up your plants. What there is such a thing as is you were growing the wrong stuff during the wrong time of year. There's an entire set of vegetables that thrive on our long days and direct sunlight of summer. Okay? Everything else is supposed to be grown fall through winter and into spring and stopped around Father's Day. The summer plants can be started when it warms up in March or April and can be grown through that intense summer and into, uh, you know, early fall, late summer, early fall. So that being said, you, you really shouldn't be putting your garden, if you, if you don't have a choice, that's completely different. If you don't have a choice and you only have shady areas or dappled light under an oak tree, I'm not, I'm not saying you can't garden. But what I am saying is I've seen person after person after person put their garden in a place to protect it from the sunlight, okay? I've done side-by-side -side experiments where I've had, I have I have a gardens where we have beds lined up just straight across. 
and and oak trees on this side kind of shading these beds and in january i'll do it again this year in january because i always want to show people this in january i will put jericho romaine lettuce and cabbage in these beds over here and then out here in full 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 sun like the second it comes over the horizon the second it goes below the horizon full sun i'll put the same stuff in these beds out here and most people would say, oh, yeah, Fe February, gosh, you know, you want to start backing those winter vegetables up into a more shady spot because that extends your growing season longer into the summer. Well, I got news for you. The stuff that was in the more shady location did last longer. Okay, it did make it longer, but that's because it was taking longer. The stuff in full sun was like four times as big and ready to harvest in half the time. Like we had that stuff out. It was done by the beginning of April. Now I left some of them in, in the more sunny location. And yeah, they did like start frying after April. They started looking really bad. And the ones in the shade, they just kept trucking along, but we didn't even get to harvest those until mid May. They took twice as long in the more shade. So, so we could, grow them further into the summer, but they took twice as long. How does that equal out? If you have choices to pick a shadier location so you can extend your growing season, if the stuff's going to take twice as long, that just doesn't make sense. That is not a good return on your investment on time and space. So good old Mr. Sunshine is what the plants need. I have never seen a big farm driving around in the in the countryside. You know, I, I've never seen a big farm with just acres and acres and acres and acres of shade cloth. Those plants are out in the middle of God and everybody. No shade, okay? So if for your own personal garden, you might find that um, I'm not saying some shade isn't good for some plants say take some herbs for example i do have some gardens that do get a little bit more shade and then if i'm doing a really late planting say you know april ish and i want to get some a, a last round of our heat tolerant uh lettuces i will put them in some more shade um but typically by then i'm like switching to the callaloos and the malabar spinach and uh the amaranths and all the all the good summer crops that i haven't gotten to eat all winter um and uh, late fall winter and spring so when you kind of get on this nice rotation of of flip-flopping from one uh kind of section of crops to the next you got no problem switching to the next round of crops because you haven't seen it until the next year so i mean just try i'm trying to come up with another analogy of like trying to keep your spring stuff in too long instead of switching to summer crops could so let's just say I'm trying to think of some that most people would agree with because I know some of you in your head right now that are listening to this are arguing with me, but um, let, let's just say uh, that everybody here loves kale, right? You know, you guys all love kale. I'm assuming if you're watching me, you love kale. If you don't, I feel sorry for you. Um, everybody loves kale, right? So imagine talking to somebody who has their garden completely filled with okra. And they've been growing okra all summer. They haven't had kale fresh from their garden since last May. They've been growing okra all summer. And simultaneously, they're coming to you, talking to you about, and it's, say, it's uh, September, October, right? And they're like, man, this colder weather and shorter days are killing my okra. It looks like crap. I got aphids on it. What can I spray on it? It looks really bad. Wouldn't you just want to shake them and be like, dude, just whip it out. It's time to plant kale. Like, move on to the next thing. So, try and make your experimentation really experimentation. Figure out the seasons, figure out what grows when, and stick to it. Last. Well, I don't know last. Next. There might be more. This one was kind of weird for us, but and it took me a while to figure this one out. Figure out what your family's going to eat how much it costs at the grocery store so you might be able to grow the heck out of something um by the multitude but 
before you start gardening, maybe y'all ate it once a month, once every two months, if that. Um, it's a pain to clean it in the kitchen. Um, the dishes to cook, you know, cook it with are, are time consuming. So you grow a ton of it and you find out that most of it just kind of rots. So figuring out not only what's going to happen in your garden, but also what happens you know, between you and your family members and in your kitchen as well. That's, that's really important. I know for us, I don't grow as much lettuce as I would like to over the winter for, for me personally, because I know this sounds weird, whip me with a wet noodle, but we just don't have time to clean it. <laughs> We're all very busy. And I mean, I love fresh lettuce out of my garden, don't get me wrong. But when I was growing as much of it as I could and what I had space for, I was finding a lot of it was rotting in the refrigerator. So, so utilizing your space appropriate to not only what you can grow, but what you can grow and what you're going to eat. And then also how much real estate and time does it take up in your garden versus how much does it cost at the grocery store? Can you find it easily from local farmers for pretty cheap? A good example for this. Yes, Kenny, exactly. A good example for this is cabbage. I love growing cabbage. I love watching cabbage grow. That's the garden hobbyist in me talking. The gardener who is interested in return on investment realizes that uh, first of all, it takes us three weeks to eat one cabbage and we will make coleslaw with it. We'll put it in tacos and just ever, I swear, every time I take that head of cabbage out and I cut another slice or two off of it, it's the same size. It just doesn't go anywhere. Um, so it'll take us a week to three weeks to eat one head of cabbage. You know, maybe we could speed things up if every two weeks we had some sort of, I don't know, maybe if we were Irish or something, I would we go through it faster. Uh, but that's for us, for our family. So cabbage might be a good one for you because you guys eat a whole lot of it. But for my family, planting one or two heads of cabbage at a time and then maybe waiting a couple weeks, planting another head or two of cabbage, planting something in between them, maybe like onions, um, but really not that much. And it keeps forever in your fridge. And you know what? If I'm not growing cabbage in my garden, um, it's not too hard for me to get in the car and, and drive to the grocery store and buy cabbage that is pretty decent quality. So that's the other thing I look at is from farmer's markets or at the grocery store, what's the quality and what's the price point of what you're buying. Now... <laughs> Amanda Street says, this is why I don't grow sweet potatoes, but I love cabbage. So she's just the opposite, right? So, I mean, sweet potatoes is another one because uh, that's iffy unless you have some space that you're not using. You know, they take three to five months. And if you do the math on what I was saying about staying in season, if you're limited on space and you grow sweet potatoes, they are going to cut into either your spring garden well, you already know they're going to cut into your summer garden. So I'm talking about as a replacement. But they're either going to cut into your spring garden or your fall garden. You either got to cut your, you either got to cut your spring garden short and go ahead and get those sweet potatoes going in that space, or you're going to lose out on time on your fall garden. Okay. Um, those are another one that are pretty easy to find in decent quality at the grocery store or at a farmer's market, you know, they're, and they're not expensive at all. So for me personally, for my family, the crops that I think we got the biggest return on investment, and I mean like if I'm buying at a farmer's market or go to the grocery store, I'm going to give you our list. And you're not going to be surprised. Top of the list for us is Swiss chard. Oh my gosh. Um, back when I started doing this 13 years ago, 
you could get a bundle of Switch charge like this big at the grocery store. It was like 99 cents, right? I mean, I mean, like when I started doing this, it was really hard to justify gardening and it not be a hobby. But since the prices at the grocery store have gone up, uh, three, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred percent. Um, it it actually is a lot easier to make it make sense to garden. So if if there ever, this isn't a good thing, but if there ever was a time that it makes more sense to garden financially, it's now. Um, that that you could invest more time and money in it, and it's still worth it because of how expensive the, the, the produce is at the grocery store. So, you know, Swiss chart. Now it's, I think a bundle, like it's like, I swear three stems and leaves is like three ninety nine dollars now at the store for Swiss chart that um, isn't even organic. The other one that I think is a good uh, investment is um, kale. I mean, you can't kale collards. Um, it's even hard, I think, to find decent collards at the grocery store most of the time, um, let alone how much they cost now. Um, kale, they just keep going. I mean, you, it, in Central Florida, you can almost grow kale year round. It's got a real short window that it's either same with collards, a uh, real short window that it either doesn't really do that well or doesn't taste very good, but it can still survive. But for the most part, it's one of our first winter crops that we plant, and it's definitely one of the last ones that we rip out is uh, is uh, collards and um, Swiss chard. One of the ones I have a little bit of problem with, but I, I mean, I got it down a, a few years ago, but it took a little bit of work to really figure it out where it made sense, was broccoli. Um, pretty easy to grow uh, what i found is that to make to get a better return on my investment on broccoli i had to I plant a mixture of um uh sprouting broccolis and uh heading uh broccolis broccoli plants take up a lot of room so basically what i would do is um there's really not that much if I didn't have a lot of summer stuff in, broccoli is pretty heat tolerant as small seedlings, and I would get a lot of it in my garden beds uh, at the very beginning. So basically, I'd be planting broccoli out, broccoli starts, as soon as I thought it was going to cool off a little bit. By cool off, I mean like where you walk outside in the morning, you're not questioning every decision you've made up to this point. That's what I mean by cool off. So basically, cool enough to where you're not miserable when you walk outside in the morning. So as soon as it cools off a little bit in September or October, I would plant the broccoli out and I would plant, I mean, like I would take up almost as much space as I could afford with, with the broccoli. And I would have a nice mix. I'd have about three quarters of head broccoli and the, the rest of it were sprouting broccolis. Now, I want everybody to, who's grown broccoli to understand the difference between a head broccoli and a sprouting broccoli other than the obvious, okay? Head broccolis will sprout, but that's not what the plant was built to do. But they kind of sprout. They, they put out some sprouts. If you've never grown a sprouting broccoli, then and you think that heading broccoli sprouts after you chop the head off, then <laughs> you're in for a surprise. So um, I would plant all this three-quarters of my space uh, would be heading broccoli. As soon as those head broccolis were, were done, I would chop them up, blanch them, freeze them, and vacuum seal them. Okay? And then rip the plants out. And I would get into more winter or fall crops. So I would just use that space for a very short period of time, pull the plants out, stick the stuff in the freezer. Then, during broccoli season, I'd have my four sprouting broccoli plants that are putting out the sprouts with the smaller florets on that we would pick off of. And that would give us our broccoli two nights a week for the family of four of us. So that by the time broccoli season was over, okay, 
And I would even get to the point sometimes that sprouting broccoli would be producing so much, some of that had to go in my freezer too. So another way to get a better return on investment on your gardening is that when, when the season's going on, try and plant enough of that vegetable that you're getting enough out of the garden. And if it's something that you know how to prepare for storage, that doesn't take too much time, you store it. And then once that plant season is over and you're saying, let's just take broccoli and okra, for example, if during okra season, you plant enough okra where you guys are eating as much okra as you can and you're freezing it, then during broccoli season, you're not eating as much broccoli out of your garden and you can freeze more of it because you're pulling the okra out of your freezer to eating that. And I'm just saying freezer because that's the lowest hanging fruit for everybody. Um, it's definitely worth it to learn how to can and ferment and I'm going to start dehydrating. So long-term storage, that's basically what I'm talking about. So getting in some sort of a rotation where you're not reliant on exactly what is growing in your garden at that time, um, it, it just takes a little bit of time to get over that hump into a point where you can eat from your previous seasons that you've stored, which means you're putting less pressure on your garden, which means you can store more out of your garden and it turns into a perpetual cycle. So um, I've been yammering on here for about 45 minutes. Um, yeah, so basically to get a better return on investment in your garden, be honest with yourself, uh, figure out what experimentation actually means and do it. If you are trying to get better at it, don't just keep fooling yourself. So either be honest with yourself that it's just a hobby, um, uh, or, uh, or, or be honest with yourself that you're trying to make it into something that you're actually getting something out of this investment or being honest with yourself at where you are on the spectrum in between the two. Okay. Just, just be honest with yourself. Don't, if you somewhere inside of you, you really want to get this down pat. It means you just, you got to get a little more serious about it. That's all. It's not all fun and games. Do a little more research, write some notes, take some notes, write some stuff down. Uh, get some get some goals, get some plans as far as where you want to be by a certain time, um, uh, and and share those with people and with your fellow gardeners. So a little bit of accountability doesn't help, doesn't hurt either. Um, another thing to do to get a better return on investment for your garden, if you have one, if you have a garden at your house, if you have one nearby and they have space available, join a community garden. I mean that's 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 a great way to to start uh, building your uh, resilience and your uh, your tools and your information basically your 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 bank of all the tools of information and good things that you're going to need to pull from to become more a more successful gardener. Um, so yeah, try and try and uh, back off on the experimentation. Um, Stick with the seasons. Stop trying to push the limits of your zone. Blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying not to do it, but don't do it with everything. You know, like I think when I was really rocking and rolling, you guys have got to understand something. I don't have a garden at my house anymore. I do this professionally now. And, you know, the cobbler's kids go without shoes. So, um, my whole garden area is now a nursery that I run my business out of. And my whole entire front yard garden is now fruit trees. So I don't really have an annual vegetable garden at my house anymore. Um, but when I was doing it and when I'm working with a client and they want to get serious about it, I mean, having fun with it and doing experimentation and also doing some playing, I think that's a big part of it as well. Um, so maybe like 80% of your crop space and time should be spent on things that, you know, are, are relatively easy. You know they're going to do well. You know you're going to eat them. You know that you're in the right season. And then maybe 20% of your space and time is spent dilly-dallying with stuff, whether it's serious experimentation or just getting out there screwing around. You know, like, hey, this guy gave me these seeds. I'm just going to try them. You know, again, that's, there's nothing wrong with, with that. But I think that there needs to be a um, – there's, there's definitely a trade-off. Um. But yeah, get to know your seasons uh, and figure out what to plant when and stick with them. That's 90% of your pest control right there. 90% of people's pest problems that I see all the time is because they got something growing when and where it shouldn't be. 
Make sure your stuff is getting good sunlight. Focus on your soil. I didn't mention that because um, it, it is the <laughs> it is the most important thing, but it's the one thing I'm not going to mention. Good soil or decent soil for at least your first year can be bought. Um, I personally don't think it is, even though it's the most important thing, I don't think it's the first thing you need to worry about. I think people need to worry about what to plant and when first. They need to worry about uh, making sure that their garden gets the right amount of sunshine, making figuring out watering cycles, all that stuff. You can keep going to the store and buying really decent garden soil. Um, we sell it. This isn't a ploy to sell more garden soil. And then once you get some success under your belt, then we can start talking about some of the more intense um, concepts of sustaining your garden in the long run. And then so so basically, you know, first year or two, the focus is on the plants and your overall garden and your garden plan and what are you going to grow and getting all that stuff down. You're getting into year th two, three, four. It's time to really get into the soil science and focusing on the soil and building up that organic matter and learning how to feed those microbes. It's just what I found is when I would focus on the most important thing first with people, it, it takes time to build up soil. It's a lot of information. There's even a lot of the information that's out there that's still questionable because you're talking about soil. So like these people say this thing and these people say this thing and you got to kind of pick and choose what you believe there's just there's a lot there it's like a whole it's a whole world but it's the most important thing i mean if you have healthy soil and you follow these other things you're going to have healthy plants but i don't think even though it's the most important thing i don't think it's the first thing that you should worry about that's like that's like black belt stuff and i'm not saying you don't start learning that stuff about soil in the beginning but if you focus too hard on it in the very very beginning you're not going to be growing much you're going to be just building soil so those are kind of some of my simple, basic uh, concepts for a better return on investment in your garden. Um, you know, if, it, if it's not working for you, like I um, usually do really well with eggplants this time of year. I just left a garden today that the uh, eggplants, they're just not producing. They're not producing. Um, plants look like garbage. And uh, right in the middle of the row where the eggplants are, um, We've got kale. It looks beautiful. It's doing beautiful. I'm ripped them out. I'm putting in more kale. Um, another garden still has zucchini in. It's our powdery mildew resistant zucchini. And every week we show up and we cut the dead stuff off the outside from the frost. And every week I tell those zucchini plants, you guys look like crap. You guys are not in season right now. I swear to you, if I come back next week and every single one of you don't have a zucchini on it, you're all coming out. And the next week, they all have a zucchini on them. So they're spang. <laughs> but, but the second their production drops at all, <laughs> I have a whole bunch of stuff I'm ready to plant in that area because they're way out of season. Um, you know, we're keeping a real close eye on But anyway, let me go to the questions here. And um, thank you, everybody, though, for uh, for tuning in today. 2021, can you believe it? Mike Mason says TMI. Yes, it was when I was doing my Christmas gifts. Probably when I was talking about my underwear. Kenny Gill says he was jelly of my dehydrator. You should be. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, no, seriously, if you anybody, if I have a dehydrator now, if anybody has excess fruits and vegetables, if this thing is not running 24-7. It can be used more. I will be more than happy to dehydrate stuff for you, and we will just keep some of it and give you some of it. Um, I've got a neighbor down the road who's got a bunch of fruit trees, and they're always on the ground, and I'm so excited to go meet him. Uh, Michael Thorne planted bead seeds today myself. Interesting fact about beets. So beets and chard. You know how the seeds look really funky? They're all bumpy and stuff. That's actually a dried up flower. That's not the beet seed. That little funky looking thing that looks like a dried up pea actually contains seeds in it. 
And there can be one seed in there. It can be two, three, four, up to five seeds in that little thing, uh, which is why even if you follow proper plant spacing with your beet seeds, they can still come up in clusters of two and three and four. And same thing with your chart. So they have developed. So beets, like no matter, even if you use seed tape, you still got to go in and thin them out, right? So they've hybridized and made a beet that only has one seed in each dried up flower because, uh, and they're super expensive, because the amount of time that it takes for a farmer to send all the workers back out in the field to thin those beets out, it's just, it wasn't making sense financially. So they spent all this time and money developing <laughs> beet seeds that have less seeds in them. So there you go. And I'll be planting more beets till I, I mean like end of February, March, I'm looking at the uh the jet stream predictions. I'm looking at you know all all the predictions that I possibly can. Farmers Almanac, color of the sky, talk to some sailors, the whole nine yards. Because sometimes my late season planting of winter stuff is around the middle to end of February. And sometimes I've planted, like, say, carrots as late as the end of March and done really well with them. It just depends on the weather at that point. So I'll be planting more beets till, uh, you know, at least the end of February, beginning of March. Stephanie Simpson says that's a reality check. Yes. It's Michael Thorne. Again, I clock over two miles a day in my garden, and I'm on a corner city lot. Yep, lots of work and good ex exercise. Susan, Jenny, do you have strawberry plants for sale? No, I don't, Jenny. That ship has sailed. Typically, our uh, strawberry plants, we sell out in November. We get them in the end of September to October, and we sell out. Uh, check, my buddy, uh, check out my buddy Rob over at bob's berries hang on so my buddy rob over at bob's berries uh and he will Beep. He still has strawberry plants. Get in touch with him. You can Google it. And uh, I think he has a sweet sensation still. And I think they're a half off or two for one or something like that. I'm sorry, Rob, if I misspoke and the sale is not going on. Shh. All right. My old buddy Kevin says hi. Uh, we went to high school together. Really appreciate him tuning in from New York City because I know this has nothing to do with gardening up there. Uh, Amy Lowry, I'm new to gardening. Hey, Amy. Uh, yeah, I know you from the gardening groups. I'm new to gardening and had to learn the hard way, uh, planting the right thing at the right time. I'm still learning. We're all still learning, and there's lots of room for experimentation, but don't put all your eggs in that basket for sure. Look at the new farm tech. Kenny Gill says, look at the new farm tech for growing under solar panels. Oh, like I'm dying right now. I just, I had this vision. I'm sure there's something to it, but I had this vision in my head of like growing under solar panels to power grow lights. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about that a long time ago about an indoor operation. We were talking about how they could save save money. And they were like, well, we could power the grow lights with, with uh, solar panels with the sun. And I just kind of had to stop for a second. I was like, uh, how about we just cut out the middleman? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, it makes sense if you got to keep them cooler or something. But uh, they ran tests. Forgot what university, uh, the space rose, the solar panels, and rose potatoes. When spaced correctly, they were able to get like 80% of typical harvest and still produce 
substantial energy to sell back to the grid. I'm sure this, I'm sure that the solar panels were still letting sunlight through. You're just talking about using, efficiently using the space. So it'd be like growing stuff in the big strips that contain the power lines. I think that's where you're going with that. Agrivoltaics. Okay. Michael Thorne says, what about tree collards? I know people who've done okay with them, and I know a lot of people who have not done so okay with them. You know, bringing stuff like that into your loop. So, like, you know, if I found out that people over in St. Pete were doing okay with them, and then maybe a couple people in Lutz and South Tampa were doing really well, and everybody else I talked to, just they weren't worth it. You know, I kept hearing that over and over. I would dedicate so little space to them and um, and just make absolutely sure that that could work for me and my microclimate. I would assume there was something going on like that with microclimates. Uh, unless you know your microclimate backward and forward and the sides of your buildings and all that stuff and know and can pretty much deduce where something's doing well and where it's not, what the microclimates are that it's working in, you know, then you could obviously, you know, do it and knock it out of the park. Kenny says, eat broccoli leaves after harvesting heads versus growing collards. Well, no. If you want leaves, grow collards. You will get 20 times the leaves off. If you want collards in the spot where you have your broccoli, then that's what I'm saying, what I was saying earlier. I used to keep the broccoli around and harvest the leaves and the florets that come came off of it afterward. But, you know, it's like the, the sprouting broccoli didn't give me a whole lot of broccoli on the front end all at once. And then the, the heading broccoli uh, didn't really put out that many leaves and florets for it to be worth the space that it was taking up. So I'd rip the broccoli plant out and have a started collard plant that I would replace it with two, three, four collard plants actually in that space rather than keep that broccoli plant there just for the leaves. If it's leaves you want, there's better plants that do that job as far as the amount of fertilizer that they take, the amount of production that they have per square foot. This is that return on investment mentality. One of the, I mean, I didn't mention this. One of the things you have to do is you have to get yourself into a headspace of being able to kill things. I think that's another reason people have issues with getting a good return on their investment on their time is they just they hang on to stuff for too long because they, they're, too, they're too attached to it. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing if it's your cute little, if it's your cute little uh, succulent garden. It's another thing if it's a big old nasty tomato plant that you literally bought for the sole purpose of feeding you. And if it's not doing its job, I mean, I'm going to jump off the rails for just a second and talk about tomatoes because every one of you that's watching right now, that knows somebody or is doing this yourself, you've been covered, you covered up your tomatoes already two or three times, please do yourself a favor. Next week, get some tomato seeds and plant them. Get a little paper cup and plant them in the paper cup and stick them outside or in a window. When we're out of danger of frost, this tomato plant that you have that you've had since fall that you're probably going to need to cover two three four more times i want you to take the tomato plant that you just started by seed and somewhere out in your garden in the general vicinity of this tomato plant that you've been hanging on to that you could have been growing spinach in its place or kale I want you to plant this freshy fresh tomato plant out there right next to it. And I want you to tell me which one gives you more tomatoes in the spring, which one has less disease problems, and which one lasts longer into the summer. So if you're going to waste a bunch, I mean, spend a bunch of time covering these plants up, do yourself a favor, and, you know, also kind of think about 
if all the nights that you've gone out there to cover and uncover, like what if you've been out there spending, tearing those tomato plants out, tilling the soil, and putting out fresh seeds of spinach? During this time when that tom tomato plant's going dormant from the freezes, and like half the little plant that was touching the cloth is turning to mush right now, you know, if you've been spending all that time and energy, your investment into something that is going to produce this time of year and be really, really happy and, and, and still plant your new tomato in January for the spring. You know, if you don't do that side by side experiment, you won't ever know if what you were doing was worth it for next year. And most of you are probably holding on to those tomato plants. It's an emotional thing. Because you just can't kill it because it had so many tomatoes on it. Don't get me wrong. I will have, like, during our mild uh, mild years, mild more mild winters, um, or if I've started my tomato plants and maybe I planted them out in a garden uh, in January, start January, seeds, third week of February, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm going to go ahead and plant them out. Second week of March, we get a frost. I'm out there covering I'm not saying I never cover my tomatoes, but that makes a lot more sense than something that you planted last July and you're trying to get it to make it through the winter. Listen, we have more mild winters than we do cold winters. We have more mild winters where those tomato plants will make it well into January without covering and you don't get spinach and your kale has aphids on because it's too damn hot. Roll with it, baby. It's going to be a colder winter, you know. It's just not the one for tomatoes. But like I said, do yourself a favor. Put some fresh, even you don't put start seeds in January. Come spring when it's time to plant tomatoes out. Do yourself a favor. Buy some fresh plants. Put them out there next to the ones that you wasted, spent all this time having them limp through the winter. Um, and tell me which one does better for spring. You're, you won't do it again. Okay, so Michael Thorne, China sent me seeds. I think I'm going to try them. Oh, geez, Michael, don't do that. <laughs> uh, I do know a couple people who actually got them. It was kind of funny. Um, I'm not sure what they did with them either. They didn't really talk about it. Maybe they did plant them out. Amy, I know this is off topic, but I would love for you to do a video about starting a garden from seed. I'm going to be trying seed soon for the spring garden for the first time and i'm so nervous um i mean that definitely is never going to be one of my weekly videos i keep promising myself like literally the gopro is in my car and i keep promising myself that when i'm out in the field during the week doing all the stuff that i do that i'm going to get that gopro i'm going to set it up and i'm going to start doing some short videos now here's the here's the catch i'm only going to put those up on youtube so if I, I will. I promise I'll get to it. This was my 2020 vision, right, which went out the door. So now this is my 2021 vision um, is to make more videos and, and really get, get lots of content up on my YouTube. Um, and, and that's why I have the GoPro in my car. Hopefully it'll make it out into the garden and I'll start filming some of this stuff. But that'll be on the YouTube channel. It's Whitwam Organics. Uh, I think Tampa, Whitworm Organics, Tampa, but you can just type in Whitworm Organics. The channel will come out up. So if you want to see those videos, I suggest you roll on over to YouTube and subscribe to my channel. Uh, that's my actually rolled right into my plug, <laughs> my end of the video plug. Thanks, Amy. All right, Kenny, great idea. I've been teaching my students how to read seed packs, when to plant, how long until harvest, how to... How do you... How deep to plant it? <laughs> One thing for starting seeds and plug trays is to look at soil temp for best germination. Johnny Seed Catalog has little charts for certain types of plants and soil germination rates by temperature. Kenny says it's time for farmers to diversify. And Lisa Panita says, I just love science experiments in the garden. And I love you. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, you can join me every week on Facebook if you want to uh, join me live. If you can't join me live, uh, you are more than welcome to email your 
uh, topic suggestions or um, or your questions to info, info at witwomorganics.com. So if I get an email with your topic or question, I'll be sure to bring it up if you're only able to watch these uh, pre-recorded. Please, 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 everybody, go over to my YouTube channel at Witwom Organics and subscribe. I promise I will be putting more content up that will be exclusive to my YouTube channel. You guys, tune in next week. I'm very excited about my guest. I'm going to keep it a surprise, but you definitely want to be here. It's going to be a beautiful show. Thank you, everybody, and see you next year.